it must have seemed like the good times would never end. But then, China happened. That screen, it starts with an earthquake. Birds and snakes in the airplane. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. Eye of a hurricane, listen to yourself, churn world, sit the Sony, storm the serve your own, he speeded up a knock, speak, grunt, no strength, no ladder, start to plan a with the team. told you within the last hour uh, that the English Football League had agreed to suspend all matches until the 3rd of April. Uh, we are now being told that uh, following suit, the FA, the Premier League, the EFL and Barclays FA Women's Super League and also the FA Women's Championship have all collectively agreed now to postpone the professional game in England. Tell me with the rapture and the reverend in the right, right, you vitriotic, patriotic, slam fight, bright light, feeling pretty sight. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Six o'clock TV hour, don't get caught in foreign terror, slash and burn. But I, 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 I'm shaking hands. I was at a, I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus patients, and I shook hands with everybody. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, and, and I continue to shake hands, and uh, uh, I think it's very important that we, you know, our judgment is wash. Uh, washing your hands is the crucial thing. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world. Just under one hour's time, the best league in the world will be back up and running after a hundred day pause. But we do need fans to play their part too. So please look after your fellow fans and your communities by watching from home. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. Hello and welcome to The Town Social. Football is more than just what happens on the pitch. It's about the social aspect, the family and the friendship it brings together, and the many different opinions that we all have. As football and society gets to grip with COVID-19, football fans like us can't be in the stadium watching the club that we love. We can't do the usual things that we do, whether it be the pub or meeting up with family and friends. We can't have those heated debates about the starting lineup or point out who's been crap that game. So that's why we've created this, the Town Social. We're an independent Huddersfield Town podcast where all opinions within reason are welcome. We don't want to have the same people on every week. We want you, the listener, to get involved and we want different voices, different opinions and just to talk about football. So over the next few weeks until the end of the season, we're going to be doing this. So please listen in, join the conversation on social media and let's try and enjoy this new normal. Anyway, to the introductions, my name is Greg Moore and I thought my podcasting days were long behind me. Joining me from down under is a man who once assisted Cameron Jerome four times in a game and it isn't bitter about being scouted, Mr Ian Kilroy. Also joining me is the man who set up the new down at the back over a decade ago, Adam Roberts. And my old mate who sports York but has wasted too much time watching Huddersfield Town as well, John Dibley Dobson. Gentlemen, hello, <laughs> how are we? Yeah, that's my official little name now. You're great. <laughs> the yeah, market, good, thanks. How's Australia, Ian? Cold, cold. Winter solstice today. We're all uh, out praising the moon and, and the sun and what have you. But um, still in shorts, so uh, I can't complain too much. I'd say it's the longest day of the year, Ian. It was probably the longest day of football yesterday, but we'll, we'll get into that now. Um, Huddersfield Town, nil, Wigan Athletic, two. Um, pathetic, I think, is the words to describe the performance. Uh, gentlemen, how did you see it? Because to say we haven't had over 100 days of football, everyone was very excited and we got served up uh, rather than a nice three course meal uh, tripe. A massive game, wasn't it? And um, before the hiatus, I, I think we were all looking at this one, thinking win this, and it's probably job done. Three months later, we finally get around to it, and 
Yeah, normal service has been resumed. It felt like um, it felt comfortable to me to be back being that poor. Everybody getting so hyped up for it. There were like Zoom parties got arranged. And 10, 15 minutes in, the service wasn't working. We got to turn it on and then town were, just didn't show up. There was just <laughs> so no plan. Well. Yeah, it was just like back to normal. Everything's all good with the world again. <laughs> I think the fans, I think the fans fell into this um, state of belief that because it was a, on paper an easier game against a not very long ago promoted uh, Wigan, that it, it was a game we should be winning. And um, people believe that without looking at the form. Um, Wigan are much better than, than they appear. I don't think they've conceded for the last five games, yet the fans came into this thinking, this is an easy one, a regular, uh, an easy win. We'll take the three points. Basically, assure ourselves of safety, um, looking at the fixtures before the game of, of other teams around us. And... Um, Unfortunately, not only did our game go against us, everybody else did too. So um, we now find ourselves in, in a position that, that looks pretty dire at the moment. Uh, but Ian mentions form. What form? You, you can say they haven't conceded in five games or whatever, but that was, you know, that might as well be yeah, last I, season. I get that, um, but you still, you've still got that kind of impetus, haven't you? You've still got that kind of positivity in the squad because you, you know you've been doing well. I know it was quite a while ago, but... And everybody around the club are still kind of... Uh, Wigan were a better team than us when we played them at their place. They played miles of better football. And yesterday they looked really well organised, difficult to break down. And we just didn't look like we had a clue how to get past them. Well, no, Wigan, Wigan were unbeaten in six before that. They'd beaten West Brom. Did Drew against Leeds. Paul Cook's yeah, a very true. good manager in, in my, my eyes. I, 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 I've seen him run it back in uni days. Just everything about yesterday was funny, and I, I, not in a good sense because you, you'd have three months without football. You've got uh, thousands of fans wanting to get get on iFollow. Hey, that that just <laughs> right. Me and Ian had a conversation last week about this. I, he said it. He, he said the first minute would go down, and it went down before any, any anyone had actually kicked the ball. There it was, was, it was nailed on to happen. Nailed on to happen. That. Well, they've only I, had I, three I, months to stress test that whole system, and it looks like they've done absolutely bugger all. That's the EFL so fee, isn't it? kind of inevitable. But yeah, there are people who, who, and let's be honest, like we're all tight Yorkshire people. Uh, <laughs> and it's inherent by birth. There are people who, who've not been able to, and I looked on Twitter last night, there were quite a few people who actually didn't get to see it whatsoever. Town put a statement out, which doesn't mean anything. Night and the same with the EFL putting a statement out. Well, you know, I wish you'd taken my money back now because, like, Adam, I was watching it on your periscope for the first time. I know, time. I tried, mate. I, I did try for a bit. I mean, the view of your radiator was fantastic. <laughs> That's what I was most impressed with. But it's just like, it was the performance at the end of the game. It was laughable. It was kind of like a bunch of, of lads who just come together and thought, oh, we're playing Emily away pre-season. And then just just the aftermath, it, it, it was good old-fashioned town. Do you, think, uh, do you think the, the lack of fans contributed? Do you think we'd, they they'd have, would have played that bad had there been 20,000 people screaming at them in the, in the stadium? Probably not. It, uh, the last, last 15, 20 minutes were just so lethargic to say that we were 2-0 down. And I just don't think that would have happened with people baying to the blood. And I don't know, but it's, um, I just um, think we're going to suffer against it. You've seen enough games down there to know that 2-0 down... 15 20 minutes left, half of them are going. Yeah, I mean, Greg said he'd have been in the Vulcan at about half time, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, you know it with town when they're not doing so well, it's not an encouraging atmosphere there. No, I understand that, but also they look comfortable to be losing almost. The minute. Right, yeah, get you. Yeah, and I, I think everyone says it's the same for both teams, but. I think from the was it the Bundesliga or the La Liga yeah. that, that three three quarters of the games uh, have been won by away teams. Yeah. So I, you it, know that, yesterday, that, Greg. Yesterday in in our league, there was um, I think it was one home victory. I think it was one home victory in the nine games. It does make it. a difference. It really does make a difference. And you know, I, I'm a cricket fan as well. We can all remember Mitchell Johnson getting absolutely <laughs> shafted by the Barmy Army in Australia. He was mentally absolutely taken to pieces, and fans can do that. And you know, I I remember going to Notts County uh, back in League One, and Lee Hughes getting absolutely pelters from all of us, and he should have been sent off because of it. He got into your head, so it it makes a massive difference. 
you know, I'm glad I'm glad there was no piped fan noise. Yeah, I, I, that's utterly ridiculous. I watched the couple of games yesterday. Uh, I mean, it feels like a bit of a World Cup at the minute, which is quite nice. It's just football on every day. So, but um, the fan noise is just a bit pathetic, and I, I know why they've done it. They've, they've tried to kind of recreate the atmosphere, but it's I think a the tricky good... one. Um, without any noise whatsoever, it's a really strange thing to watch yeah. on the TV. It's, it is like Wednesday nights down the Power League. But you can overdo it, and certainly Sky, their their crowd noise has been really kind of it's detracted from what you're actually watching. And BBC wasn't too bad last night with uh, Bournemouth and Palace because um, it was intrusive. It is, it's bizarre the noise. I, I watched a game and I can't remember where it was. It might have been was it Brighton or something like that, and it sounded like it was Boca Juniors. <laughs> I mean, the the crowd was that loud and going that mental. It's like at least make it realistic. Yeah. What would it What would it be be like at town? Just one guy going, "Fucking lump it, <laughs> <laughs> get it forward." <laughs> oh, referee, you're a shit house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, miserable it, twat that sits in front of us at press box, Greg. Oh no, I don't miss him. No, I, I'm just I'm just glad that we didn't bother going. I mean, me and John could have gone at press box, and I'm I'm so glad that. Uh, I, pied it off just because I mean bar the free pie I don't think I'd have been uh, even if they're still doing them I, I just think it would have been crucified people would have been jealous for the first five minutes and then they're like actually this is shit yeah. but yeah it, I think it made a difference I, I, I don't want to say it makes loads of difference because we've still got is it five away games so it might actually play in our favour if yeah. you know you, we go shit out a win at, at Forest for 1-0 in the 88th minute that you haven't got 20,000 people baying for your blood, it's going to be, um, you know, six or seven uh, performance staff clapping. But I think the, the good thing about not having a crowd is you could hear the players communicating. And Wigan did it a hell of a lot better. You you could hear on the commentary, Paul Cook absolutely going mental on the sidelines. And, and Town's yeah, communication... Just, just shouting at press, didn't it? Just press, press, high, high press. Town... town I was it Pritchard on ball? Nobody clearly gave him the call a man on. It was just like they were going through the motions. Lennon was so impressed with uh, Pritchard. Honestly, did you, and, and I'll get to be fair, the pair of them on the commentary, they just they kept saying he, he, he was putting in a really good effort. And from what I saw of the 20 minutes he put in, it was no better than what he's been doing recently. Um, but to pick him out, I think, after, after that performance would be unfair. There, there, were, there were problems all over the pitch. Um, and, and, and I think it does boil down to Wigan being better than we expect them to, they expected them to be. And they came to set up and make it difficult for us. They allowed us to play out from the back through one channel only. And that was Jonathan Hogg. They let Johnny Hogg get it off Stearman and Schindler. And when Hoggy turned around, he had nothing to aim at. Wigan defended in, in some form of like a, an arrow formation where they showed Hoggy out wide to Willock or um, ESR on the other side. And time and time again, it just was so slow. It was just so slow. And Glennon again, and, and okay, they kept referring to the grass being long, which is possibly the worst excuse I've ever heard <laughs> in the history <laughs> of Huddersfield Town playing awful and that the, the pitch was too lush, right? And against a team that's apparently trying to long ball it or dinosaur football tactics it, surely that should work in our favour. But instead, we just got this slow ball from the centre-backs to Hoggy, Hoggy out to Willock, and Willock did next to nothing with it. The fullbacks were offering no help whatsoever. Toffolo was having such a tough day with Pilkington taking the mick out of him. And until he went off on the 70th minute, we looked like we, con we could concede a lot of goals. When he went off, it, it changed a little bit. But at that point, it's 2-0 and it, and it makes no difference. We've but been doing that we, for a while, though. They, they seem happy to sit and, and invite a team on and hit them on the counter. And, and they've been doing it very well. Um, my cat's really not impressed with town either. <laughs> Um, as you can probably hear him in the background and the foreground now. Um, but yeah, they've got a plan. They stick to it. They do it pretty well. And yeah, to get the rewards for it. And fair enough, they're fighting for their lives. Maybe town don't realise that they are. You know, Ian, Ian said to me before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he said, I think we're, we're probably one win away and we're fine. And, and it's just, it, that might be the case because, you know, Hull are in 3-4, you know, Luton and Luton and, and Barnsley, there was a fair gap that Barnsley won. 
Uh, sorry to throw you under the bus, Ian, but you know, yeah, you cheers did say for that, that, Greg. That's fucking brilliant, um, mate. Lovely. <laughs> wow. He said we needed one win, and now we're like one point above relegation. And well, yeah, but the thing is, more, than, if more we... than one win. Cheers for that. Thank you. I, Thank saw, you so I, much. I saw a tweet on uh, on Twitter, and it said we had a, an eight percent chance of being relegated. Statistically, eight. It looking a lot more than eight percent at the moment. I'd say there's an awful lot of teams in in that bottom five or six that just look dreadful. But really do look rudderless, leaderless, and and they've still got that idiot in charge. I, I can't believe they haven't binned off yet. It looks more like a case of finding three teams that are worse than town, rather than them having to pull themselves away from it. And and that's just miserable. It's literally back to where we were when we got first promoted from League One. It's just finding there was always three to eight, three or four teams that are worse than town. Yeah, one of them were Blackpool, who were just the clusterfuck um, maybe there just aren't enough Blackpools in that league to to see town alright but that's what you're relying on now you're not relying on town to do it but, I'm just but, looking, at, I'm looking at the fixtures there and it, it doesn't look like a, an, an easy running at all for town so think, think from the running there's one or two that you would hope to get in but you know you know, looking at uh, Forest Reading have been Pretty decent this season. I mean, last game of the season, Millwall. I, I completely forgot they were seventh before uh, mm. this all kicked off. But I, I'll, I'll apologise to Ian. I'll say this. I, I said to uh, one of my mates uh, before yesterday's game. I said, "This isn't a must win. It's a must not lose." And uh, you know, if we get a point yesterday, they said, "I love it when there's a Twitter town meltdown. I think it's fantastic." <laughs> you know, I, I do it think it's really. Sport, to be fair, yeah. oh, it's it's amazing. I mean, I still remember Anthony Gerrard's, uh, what was it, team meetings uh, hashtag from like six, seven years ago. It was brilliant, but it just it's a bit concerning that, that because there's already splits in the farm base and then you've got the chairman going on. And, you know, I, I think he, he didn't say anything that he shouldn't have said, but, you know, I, I just worry that, you know, with everything that's going on, that, I mean, luckily the players are, are taken away from it, but the, the amount of negativity that's around it, rightfully so, because we have been dreadful. I fear, I fear for the next seven or eight games. Conversely, that negativity is going into the stands. Yeah, yeah, and I, th I think that's the one saving grace. Because, because if, if, and I'm thinking yesterday, I'm hundred percent when that second goal went in, one of my mates would have tapped me on the shoulder and be like, "If we don't get into it by 60th minute, we're going pub." And that's why I would have been walking up with him to Vulcan because you can always tell with town if there's going to be a, a kind of a comeback. I mean, uh, again, hello, Ian. Hello, boss. Let me throw you under it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's the one thing that the Cowleys do well is that, you know, we've seen throughout their tenure and we, you know, let's, let's, if the season started when the Cowleys took over, we'd be top eight. But they at least can change it up. And they, they tried everything yesterday. So that's the one saving grace that, the Cowleys have is that they, can, they have the ability to change it up and I, I do apologise you No do you not think though yesterday it's alright saying that right but to me the main problem was that getting the ball out from the first third to the second third I thought it was a horrendous and Danny Cowley's come out and spoke of that saying the centre-backs had a they had some sort of um, idea to split the two strikers to be able to help progress through the through the thirds um, but Hogg wasn't getting it done and on the bench we've got Chalabar we've got Chabsy there and and I don't think he's been the, the greatest for us this season, but he offers us something else at, at that DCM that I don't think Hogg can do. And I was pretty surprised. Do you mean, do you mean, do you mean the ability to, to pass the ball? Well, any, yeah, anything positive <laughs> to go forward somewhat. Um, but because I, 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 I really feel Hogg's dropped off a lot. That first season in the Premier League, he was a big reason why we stayed up. He was. And the second year, I think there was something missing. Um, and then this year, his effort is still there, but I think we need with the system that we're playing and with the other players we've got maybe, maybe it's a little bit unfair on him. But we need more from the DCM to be able to help go forward. Aaron Moore used to do it for us. We don't have him anymore. Yesterday, O'Brien was doubled up on a lot by Wigan. And I couldn't remember how many times he touched the ball. Not not, not too many. And then we've got um, Bakuna, who we know on yeah. his day, if he gets it in the final third, he's, he can be electric. He can win games for us. But yesterday, he wasn't in it. And, and to me, that came from Hoggy not being able to 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 bring the ball back, out from the back. So we had him, and I thought he should. I thought I'm amazed he didn't get given a chance. Then I'm never, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but 
the front three we had were all very similar kind of players, pretty small, pretty fast. Um, play off the last man a little bit. We've got Colin Coyne there on the bench, I think. And and he offers us something different. He offers something different. And it's a rarity. It's different. a rarity. It's a rarity it works. It's a rarity that it works. But I felt I did feel yesterday that it wasn't the um I, I thought the Cowley's got a few things wrong actually. I didn't think they they made the changes that could have affected the game more because the ones they did make, Pritchard, what did he offer? Nothing. He's he's just Do they, he have, doesn't. Do they really have that depth of option though? I mean, the players that you mentioned coming off the bench, they're pretty similar to the ones that they're replacing. Um, you know you're struggling when you're relying on Super Carl. Yeah, I, know, I know. Look, I know. I even saying it, I feel <laughs> bad. I feel like I've lost all, all, all legitimate football opinion suggesting he should be given any, any game time after. If, if everything else isn't working, then try something different. And he does offer something different. You are absolutely right. Just not necessarily good. <laughs> not necessarily, but one, once, every, once in a while, Sheffield Wednesday playoffs, it might work. We can try something different instead of just doing the same thing with slightly different faces. Try something else. I was going to say that. I was thinking this yesterday when I was watching it. I was like, what is Town's best team? Because obviously, Cal has come out and, and, and he said, uh, obviously, a similar team that beat, well, battered um, Middlesbrough. Uh, I've, I think it was 5-1 over three halves or something we beat them yeah you know he's, he's stuck with that team obviously because they've done well but I, I, you know I, I still don't know Janini Bakuna's best position I, you know I sometimes no sometimes he just drifts out of the game and he doesn't look remotely bothered I think he got knocked he, off the ball he the ball away a load of times yesterday whenever well, I've seen him he, he, he plays for about 15-20 minutes and the rest of the time you might as well have a traffic cone there uh, I guess not. Uh, it knocks um, more than Jack Wilshere. You know, he was limping at the end of the game. But is is he in our best team? Because because before COVID started, you know, I, I, he would be on the bench for me. Uh, I'd you know, you play Hogg or Talibur alongside O'Brien. You play Smith Rowe in behind Campbell or Mounier. You'd have Carlan on the left and probably. Uh, Willie Colbacuna on the right. I was really surprised when I saw that team yesterday, and I, I realised that uh, you know Campbell was uh, out injured. But our best performances have come when Carlin's on the left, and usually uh, Bakuna's starting on the bench. So you know, going to Forest, what the hell do we do? Well, it didn't help having right. two strikers injured, did it? I was going to say Kachunga. That's the first time he would have played up front since, since well, he joined, three really. years. Three. Yeah, when Naki Wells had a couple of injuries back in the season, we went up. Oh. But anyway, that was um, that was the bigger issue. He's all right. He's all right. Um, questioning if Bakuna should play and and that this that, and the other. And he had a patch at the beginning of the season when he was there and Diakabi, I think, were playing on the right hand side of him. And then a little purple patch where mm. we bagged a few goals and got a few points when the Cowleys first came in, and that was really our only outlet at the time. Um, I think the most important thing is Grant on the left. You need to have goal scorers if you're going to try and stay away from the bottom bottom of the table. Wigan, for example, they're great at the back, but I think the top scorer has got six goals. I think Kiefer Moore is their, their main man, and he's only scored six goals, and that's why they are where they are. At the back, they're pretty good, but they can't score. Grant, up top, as a nine. He doesn't score the goals that's required of a nine. For whatever reason, as, as a wide lefty, he definitely chips in with, as we know, more than his fair share. But when he's not playing on the wide left, we don't have the same penetration that we have when he when he is, and um, I think him on the left helped Bakuna and the rest of the team drive forward. It just seems to lopside a defence, and um, helps us helps us create chances. Because yesterday, uh, how many chances did we create? Two. Do we think there was a good save early? Is it in the, late in the first half? I think. Um, but even that, like yeah. it's stretching. I, I can't even remember. I cannot even. It was two a.m. at that point. I remember so many chances. We we didn't seem to seventy percent possession. With that few chances, can you remember a game where it's been like that before for us? I oh, yeah, yeah, many. <laughs> <laughs> maybe 2 a.m. Maybe because it's 2 a.m. there, John. It's 2 a.m. Yeah, here. That's why I yeah. probably can't remember them all. But uh, for me, yesterday felt especially bad. And 70.8%, I think it was. I think, I think that's what it came out of possession. With yeah, that, says a, that says an awful lot about how we can want to want to go about things. You know, Let them have the ball. Let them come on to us, and then we'll yeah. hit them. I'd like to um, see where, where we had the uh, possession. I bet oh, it was in front of the a, penalty area. Yeah, a lot of it was 
sideways yeah. passes so, between the centre halves. Definitely, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that's where you get your grumpy old man in front of us shouting, lump it. Like you said, like Pilkington, and this this is what really annoys me as well, is Pilkington was probably the best player on the pitch. And we've still never really replaced him and Gary Roberts, who were at Wigan. Uh, and that lack of creativity just, just kind of tells when when you go into them kind of games. When you when you are playing such a good a, a decent defence as Wigan are, you need that you need that final ball, you need that uh, the movement up front and you know plus we can we can review it all day because it was it was shocking that and I, trying to find a positive out of that was quite bad, but you know, it, it's the one thing that we need to di- have that spark we need to discover in the next, you know, five or six games. And it's probably going to be Smith Rowe that's that spark. Mm-hmm. He's getting the balls in the box and creating chances. I think that's the one positive that we can't play any worse. <laughs> we probably can. We probably can play I'm worse not, than that. Uh, At least we have sure 70% we possession. Why if well, we not have yeah. that? What if we've got 30%? And we, we're, we're as good at in attack as we were yesterday. It was, it, it, at least we'd have to play a Wigan again. Wigan, Wigan have us. They're, just, they're a team. We don't have the creativity. We just don't have the creativity. And I think the big worry is here, the blueprint that Wigan have set out yesterday, if any team comes and plays that way against us, I don't have the belief at all that we can, mm. we can unlock it. And especially if we're without Campbell and Mounier, because that means Grant's up front on it as, as a nine. And it just doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work for us. And the fortunate thing is, we were talking about fixtures previously, a lot of the teams we have to play, they'll be dead rubbers. So they won't sit back like Wigan did. They've got no reason to. It's a bit of a, it's a nothing game for them. I think we've got two games against promotion or playoff uh, worthy teams, and then at the end of the season we've got West Brom second. But by then you'd expect, you'd expect uh, be they, they should, they should be over by then. Yeah, it should be over by then. So Leeds or West Brom would have won it by that point. So uh, both teams promoted. That would have been an easy one, uh, hard for us to take. But um, as long, if it's an easy, uh, easier end of the season game for us, that's great. And I think Millwall as well. But they should be out of the playoff race by that point. So. Um, the positives there are that at least we've got a few fixtures that, that should, for once, help us out. As long as they don't bring a new manager in beforehand, because that always goes really well for us. <laughs> so as, long as, as, long as, as long as that doesn't happen and, and they are dead rubbers, um, I think we'll do really well. Because the away games don't matter anymore. Home games, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. Away teams are winning more than home teams. That, that's kind of gone. The fear of playing at a place like Millwall, I suppose, and, and other places like that, that doesn't exist anymore this season. So teams will win games unexpectedly based on the no home fans. And hopefully but, we can win a few because it'll be very unexpected at this rate. And I'll, I'll raise this as the last point before I move on. It, it, it is. We, we need some momentum though because uh, from playing Forest next Sunday, we have got eight games in 25, 25 days. And I mean, the last period I can remember was having that many games is probably the season we went up when we uh, played City in the FA Cup and had a replay and I think we played Nine in nine in thirty or nine in thirty-one. So this is, you know, this is going to be a strain on the squad, but on for us. But on the on the flip side, you we've got Luton involved there. You have got Birmingham, and they're they're two clubs that don't have the strongest squads. So Birmingham are in, you know, Birmingham are in the shit if we're being quite honest, because you know they've well, got two hundred percent of their income on wages. Well, exactly. So the, there's, there's, there's positives to take, and I'm ch- going to try and be positive. Everyone loves to say I'm negative, but I am trying to be positive. The positive is that if we get a little bit of momentum, it, you know it swings in the championship. You know, Wigan had the momentum before. They've probably got it now. Wigan and Leeds are the two fourth teams. They've got the momentum to go forward. We just need a little bit of that. And probably, you know, I'm, I'm going to call it, I say two more wins and we should be all right. And if <laughs> no, I'm wrong, doubling up on, yeah, doubling it's up going on me. Up. <laughs> that's the thing. That, that number's going up. And that's a yeah. real worry. But there isn't any time to build form. It's purely about getting these games done. You haven't got time to, to work on too much. You haven't got anything. You've just got to play and play and play and play and play. You haven't got the scope to have a couple of games where you're trying things out or whatever and trying formations and uh, uh, different people in different places and whatever. you just got to get it done. I think you can we can talk... I'm we really can talk, not convinced I can. We can talk all day about which team you think is going to be the best for us, formation, tactics, all that sort of thing. Yesterday, I just, I just didn't see any urgency at all. Yeah. And unless they can instill that kind of urgency, you've got to start winning games now, lads. You've got to start scoring goals. Then it doesn't matter who we put on the pitch, we're yeah. going to struggle. Absolutely. 
Well, I think that's a perfect place to end it. Um, moving on, COVID nineteen and and football. Would would you have done you three have done anything differently with the way it's gone on? Would you have null and voided? Well, uh, you know, we've seen League One, uh, League Two, just completely end with playoffs and and, and one team getting and teams getting relegated. I mean, John, you you'll learn more than most. <laughs> Uh, York, the top of the league, uh, but with points per game, you know, been, you were kind of forced into a position where you were going to have no chance of going up. Now you've got playoffs. Um, how would have you three have done things differently? And do you think we've gone down the right direction? Just to put it out there, I think we had to play football because of the money involved. I mean, we'd have been buggered without us going back to play football because of the parachute payments. But what would you have done differently? I don't know what it. Um, France did, the Dutch did very quickly. The non league game, no one avoided it very quickly and then backtracked and then backtracked on the backtrack and then you turned on the backtrack of the backtrack and then uh, did something different again. Uh, but that's because they're a shambles of an amateur organisation. I am distinctly uneasy at the fact that football's being played even without fans in the ground. Um, you know, people are still dying in the hundreds every day. Um, and in the wider scope of society, I think we were lifting lockdown far too early. Um, and you know the the science and the numbers don't back up what's what's happening out there. You can say that football coming back well, boosts to morale and all that bullshit for a start. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, look at us apart, don't it? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm distinctly uneasy about it all, and and even saying that I've watched a couple of games, so I'm part of the problem. So, what <laughs> what do you do? We, I understand we the that... commercial in, imperative, but well, yeah, and I was saying me and Ian had a conversation last week, and <laughs> I think it, it became quite obvious. I think you we we've had this battle. We put this on Twitter about a month ago. Without because the TV money, because so Sky, we've already had to re, renegotiate a deal. Uh, you know the amount of money that's relied upon in football, and this is why football has to change. And I think Phil Hodgkinson said it on talks, but it, it can't continue to go on as it is. But we keep saying it. We said it after the financial crash, but without that Sky TV money, and it's imperative in the Championship, and, and but especially in the Premier League, you got Arsenal taking twenty five percent pay cuts. I think Everton agreed to fifty percent. I, I do fear for the future of football. Uh, you know, Blackpool's chairman came out and said he reckons that 50 60 percent of clubs could be in the mire unless uh, wages dramatically decrease. I just don't know what's going to happen because you know, in the championship there's a reckoning coming anyway. Um, the numbers that uh, uh, don't stack up, you've got the vast majority, I think, as a, as a division. The clubs collectively are spending more than 100% of their income on wages. Clearly, that's not sustainable. Um, so there's a reckoning coming. I think this might have hurried it along a little bit by a year or two. Um, but that's certainly coming. And so many clubs in, in the Championship in particular gambling their futures on getting up. But only, only three clubs can get up in any one season. Bournemouth did it and got away with it. Um, QPR probably less so. Um, and the same thing is going to happen at Birmingham because that, that really is an issue that's coming to a head. I mean, even if everyone at that club takes a 50% pay cut, that means they're only spending 150% of their income on wages. <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers. Um, but then you look lower down the leagues and there's clubs who, who don't have the income in the first place and that's all gone. In the top flight, the money that you make on people coming through the gates isn't a huge drop in the ocean. Lower down the leagues, it's everything. Uh, and without that, you know, it's been three months already, then you've got to wait until whenever the next season starts. I think they're looking at September for the start of the 2021 season. Um, it's, it's, just, it's, just money. It's, it's, mo it's the only reason it's come back, money. It's the only reason. I mean, I'm quite involved in cricket, um, coach under 13 levels, and the recreational game is just totally, they don't know whether it's going to come back. And how can cricket not restart, but football has? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. No, if, if, any, if any game yeah, was, exactly. was socially distanced, it's cricket. 
It's pretty clear well, why it's come back, though, guys. It's come yeah. back, right? Because the money to the government from the taxes paid by Premier League footballers outweighs any risk of letting the guys play. These are guys that are in their early 30s at the, at the actual, absolute oldest. They're pretty fit young lads, and the, the risk to them is pretty minimal. The families mm. is a different argument. I don't, I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of that side of it, but it's come back because the, we've got players on half a million a week. What, and I'm not saying they're all uh, for tax purposes based in the UK, so it's all going into the, uh, to, <laughs> into the mm. government's pocket. I'm not saying that's what's going on, because I imagine there's some very uh, clever accounting going on here, there, and everywhere. But um, th- th- there's, there's, two, there's two problems, yes. Okay, low league football and the championship especially. People are paying far too much on salaries. But throughout history, for whatever reason, chairmen have always seemed to do it. Always seem to oh, do absolutely. it. Oh, absolutely. And the ITV Digital cost, it, cost us, us, personally, it cost town, what, 10 years? Rubri came in, he put six months into it, and all of a sudden it took us 10 years to recover from that. Um, what's going on now? If the Premier League hadn't restarted, we would have been in a lot of trouble in regards to parachute payments. Already today, um, we heard that it's going to cost, already as of today, or by the end of the season with the things that have already happened, £10 million. That's what it's cost town so far. Um, we've got players on big wages that probably shouldn't be here. They shouldn't be signed in the first place, but we, we can't. That's, a, that's a, again, another argument altogether. Um, and for town, selfishly, never mind the Football League, let's look at town. If the Football League hadn't restarted, and, and, and the TV deal, for example, next season, the season's supposed to be starting in early September, mid-September for the Premier League. If that had been delayed and all the television contracts had been voided, what would have happened to the parachute payments? What would have happened to the field town? We wouldn't have even had a club to support more than likely because season ticket sales aren't going to cover that. Lower down the leagues, you've got I solidarity payments. I follow definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm a full-time I follower, so unfortunately I've had this problem well, for 12 one. months. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one that uses it. So, uh, yeah, I turned up yesterday and there's all these 20,000 people trying to watch my channel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you've got your solidarity payments that comes from television money from the Premier League. And if the Premier League didn't restart, then well, what yeah. happened to the League Two and League One clubs now? If they can't play at all, the only thing they have coming in is a solidarity payment from the Premier League. Or the, I don't know exactly how it's paid, but I think it's basically based on the um, basically based basically based on the Premier League television money. So it's crucial for them to start and for the yeah, championship. And, and well. the Premier League are looking at renegotiating that. They're sort of framing it as some sort of um, financial bailout, but they're looking at abolition of the League Cup or something like that as a, as a method of getting it through which is further removing a long-term revenue stream from lower league clubs. It's, um, it's not a, a financial assistance. It's a predatory land grab, um, of which the Premier League has quite some form, given that it's an entire raison d'etre. Um, so uh, I, I would be aware of that. And um, solidarity... Oh, guys, it's such a loaded word when it comes to the Premier League because they are doing literally the least that they possibly could. You know what's coming. But you know what's coming. It's B-teams. B-teams, that's what's on its way. It won't be long now before B-teams are well, mentioned. I think the three o'clock, um, the protection of the Saturday three o'clock thing, I think that's pretty much gone now and I don't think it's coming back. Um, okay, the German research suggests that it hasn't had that much of an impact, but again, the culture of football in this country is so so different um, that I think once that goes it could have a real impact I mean you certainly see it at a club like York uh, it's an ageing fan base it has been forever uh, since I've been watching over 40 years um, where do the next generation of fans come from I mean, when I was still living in the city the number of Leeds United, Liverpool Blackburn shirts far outweighed the number of City shirts you saw around. Well, I, um, I saw that when I worked in Stockport, and yeah. uh, you know, us lot, oh, John, you know, you're a bit old, and Adam, you know, you're getting on a bit. Sorry, <laughs> but no, I'm non, just thinking, non second. Uh, our generation uh, of football fans, uh, you know, to me, Stockport County were always a Division One, maybe Division Two yeah. uh, club. Um, and uh, what happened with them? Obviously, you know, we got pilks out of it, but uh, you know. It was still one of my favourite away days. That, but I would when I was working there, people, I, I, you know, I, I met one Stockport County fan, and uh, everyone was City fans, and 
it's it's almost like you're getting the gentrification of football now. That yep. um, unless you're in the top couple of leagues or you're a big club in uh, in a lower, probably Bolton somewhere like that. But even Bolton will still have uh, fans who. Uh, oh, it uh, does. It, trust me, it does. Well, I yeah, live, yeah, I live in Bolton, live yeah, and it's it's full of uh, City and United, I promise you. And it used to be buried the berries in the Rochdale's and the Oldham mm. like that because I, I live with a, a Rochdale fan at unit and he. He, he also supported United. So th- that second teamism was already there. And well, we're going to see I, that. I think certainly Greater Manchester has issues like that. Um, just because you've got two massive clubs on your doorstep, um, there's no excuse in York. Nearest club's 25 miles away, and it's them. After that, it's Hull. You know, who wants to, who wants to go and watch any of that shit? Um, but <laughs> but, but no, one, no one wants to come and watch the shit that we put on. I, yeah, and, and that's the thing, you know, I, I worry, just from Huddersfield Town's perspective, that luckily that Premier League has kind of inspired the next generation. We're very, very Fingers fortuitous crossed, yeah. to say that. Because you definitely see, you know, I sit in the South Stand, you see more younger people than when we used to all pile in there for the odd game that we got to go in. And, and it, it, you know, at least they still, I don't know, talk about family club of the year and all that because Millwall won family club of the year and they've never been a yeah, family the club the Manson family <laughs> but you know you, know. you see that fan base staying if we do get relegated though no, no. And, and I know people and I, you know, I've spoken to many people about this you know I play cricket and I'm the only one probably between 25 and 35 that still plays cricket where that generation ends up having families and kids and you lose your interest in, in, in the things that you did before. And uh, luckily, the people I know who've had kids now, they want to start taking their kids to the football. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I honestly, I could see myself slipping out of uh, getting a season ticket and picking and choosing games. And, and that's a revenue stream that's immediately lost. And there are so many people... I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the figures were when, obviously, we opened up the season ticket sales compared to last year, um, especially in the olden postcode. Let's not forget that. Um, but I don't think they would have been anywhere near what they were last year. Because I think coming down... I think Premier people League, will be waiting to see exactly where they end up. I know quite a few have asked, asked for refunds, bought them, and since have asked for refunds. Yeah, well, I don't see us going to stadiums. Yeah. Let's be honest, I know the government are trying to get people in stadiums, but like John says, we're, we're rushing things. Oh, Denmark, did you see Denmark's socially distanced um, games that they ran yesterday? Everyone's two metres no. apart. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> I know Ian did because he put it on Twitter. Not like Valley Parade. They've said they've got like 25,000 there. It's like one every third seat. It looks like that. But, but like... W- we, we don't know where we're going to be and, and I still reckon even if, if we do go to go to games next year you know I'm asthmatic I am the primary carer for somebody who's in the 70s I, who's, who's still shielding I'm not going to put my money into a football club until it's safe to go back that's you know there will be people out there you're not a proper fan I don't I, to be honest I don't give a shit you know? <laughs> my primary concern is my mind my health, my mum's health, she's not very well. and uh... well, That's it, I mean, this that's the bigger issue, isn't it? Football, it's incredibly unimportant, albeit it's one of the more important, unimportant things that there is. But at, at the end of the day, if you're not here, you ain't watching anyway. <laughs> so look after yourself, do the best thing for you and your family. Football's way down the line for me. And, and that's the thing as well, we... That's why we're doing this, is because we can't have these conversations in the pub anymore. We, we, oh, we, the pub. we can't. Do you remember the pub? Yeah. Oh, was the pub. What's uh, the pub? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. These other two just like drinking on their own. I've seen them at four, God knows what time in the morning, <laughs> supping, watching God, God knows what. But you've, oh, got, you've, got, you've got to make your own fun nowadays, haven't you? You've got to make your own fun nowadays. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I don't mind the drinks breaks in football, because every drinks break yesterday, I also went to get a new uh, another can. I <laughs> know uh, it's just a crack like open. It's the only thing going. But, I've got some of them uh, five litre mini kegs from the Vocation Brewery, and pouring a beer out of a barrel. Oh, it really made me miss the pub. Oh, uh, Magic Rock, luckily, uh, Magic Rock and uh, Bradfield Brewery. I've had them beautiful. But uh, we, this we is, digress. This is, <laughs> yeah, we digress because you know it's not like us. Lot. I don't imagine it's all about the football. There's so much nah, more to football. Is. 
it's the social aspect. It's the the family aspect. Uh, mm. Probably you, you Adam, and De- yeah. Uh, yeah not sure about you, Ian. I'll, you know, do you do you make do you make your kids at, at their age watch football, and, or, or is it right, just like so, your thing? So my young lad, right, was born on the uh, <laughs> the fourth of January, right, two thousand and eighteen. Right. FA Cup third rounder. Right? No, no, no. So his first ever town season, right? Yeah. Town stayed up in the Premier League. For the rest of his entire life, it's more than likely that town will get progressively worse <laughs> and worse and worse. England reached the semi final the first summer of his life. And um, unfortunately yeah, for him, he's just going to get. It's, yeah, exactly. So he'll. He's gonna. He's been alive for the glory days, but he won't ever be able to remember it. So, uh, I've got. We've got a few photos to enjoy the uh, the brief few months we had um, <laughs> before before the second season in the Premier League. But now, nah, for me, it's an addiction. Like my life is football. I grew up, and, and my dad and I spent our in my childhood talking about football. That's how we. That's how we spoke. We didn't speak about real things. We just spoke <laughs> about football every night. There was always a football match to watch. UEFA for cup. The amount of times I've seen Chelsea play at some Nordic mould or or Viking Stravenger or something like that. To me, it, it, it is the social side of it. Yes, that is that is something that you can't replace. And since coming to Australia, I, I follow Brisbane Raw here now. It's not the same. There's no passion from the fans like you get in the UK. And it's because it's a part of you. It's a part of your childhood yeah. more, than, more often than not. Or if, if you weren't into it as a child from your parents, you kind of fall into it as a young adult. Mm-hmm. And you associate, like, for example people's music taste is normally based on what they listen to as a, as a teenager getting into that early 20s kind of phase and you don't really leave that you kind of just stick to listening to that music and to me football was the same I, I, as a kid I, I watched every bit I could as a, as a young adult I wanted to turn professional I never made it quite that far but um, it's what, it's what I, I aspired to so I tried to get as much in as possible and that's never left me so okay the social side's not there but for me I love it that it's back I can watch it I, I wouldn't care if there's they literally eleven players, no substitutes, one uh, kit man ref in. I, I still watch it because to me it's a part of my life that I can't find anywhere else. And I've tried, I've tried to find it. <laughs> I've tried State of Origin. I've tried the Asher series in Australia, and and that wasn't that wasn't a very good experience at all. Um, I, I, Town Wigan away, Town Wigan at home yesterday is better than the Ashes experience. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, that was so, five nil. There's a, there's a bit of a difference. We've, do, like, we've you, done a few of them. Lost... We've done a few of them. We're not just at a five nil. We've had a few different ones. Was it 2010 but, um, 11 series? It, oh, we win the Ashes. You go out to Australia, and it all goes wrong. It, yeah. Well, since I left, town got promoted to the. You, since I left, you. town got promoted to the Premier League. We had the Olympics in the UK and finished third. England made a semi final of a World Cup, and um, when I return to the UK, maybe next year or the year after, it's all going to go downhill further. So look forward to League <laughs> Two, boys. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, well, I think we'll see you there. <laughs> oh yeah, can't wait! Can't wait for Tramiro. I try, yeah, Tramiro. Tramiro, yeah. Oh, but, you know, I've been there in a decade. That'll be a nice trip. Um, but yeah, and, and it, it, again, it's why I, I, Ian kicked me out my ass and said, "Do this," because I'm just talking about football and like this is all we're gonna have for the next, you know, the Zoom parties. The uh, you know, I'm, I miss going into work. I work with a lot of City fans, but proper City fans, you know, the ones who were there when it was proper shit. Yeah, the, oh, like the, 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 the proper main runners. And I just miss talking about them. We've, we've tried to recreate it, work with these kind of virtual Zoom calls every 11, like 11 o'clock every day. And if you're free, jo- join in and that. And it's just, you know, I, I, I worry for the future at Huddersfield Town Football Club because of this, because I... I can see like my generation just completely falling away because unless you are kids, because you know, then you'll probably get into it again because you've got something to do on 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 a Saturday. You know, you take them to the pub, you can let them run around the, the pub, beer garden. It's already just... happening, mate. It's already happening. Bobby, uh, I asked him yesterday, "Do you want to watch the game?" Um, I said, "I'll come pick you up." No, I'm all right. I'm playing Fortnite with my mates, and um, yeah. it's just the, it, I tried to watch the. Um, you know, the Euro 96 reruns with him, stuff like that. It's just, it's totally lost all kind of love for football over this three-month period. And until we, can, until we can go do, back, yeah. yeah, until we can go back and actually experience that atmosphere, that the reason why you fell in love with it in the first place, then I think you're going to lose a lot of younger football fans from it, definitely. And on that sombre note, thank you, Adam, John, Ian, for your input. My internet is unstable and we're going to have to cut out any minute. Um, 
Thank you for listening. If you have done, please leave us some feedback at the town social on Facebook and Twitter. Until the Nottingham Forest game, see you later. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel free. Oh, it's the end of the world. It's the